Paul Poiret was the party boy of Paris, who is the unsung hero of 20th century fashion. Poiret dressed Paris finest before World War I, but as the years went on, his inability to adapt to 20s modernity led to the collapse of his company. In one of those hyperbolic moments that delighted all who knew her, Diana Vreeland once claimed that Chanel invented the 20th century for women. The statement has a stirring ring, but it is not true. It was Paul Poiret, who created clothes, that pointed to the future, a future all couturiers, including Chanel, tapped into in the 20s and 30s, a time when, ironically, Poiret, the great inventor and beacon of modernity, was out in the cold. Never able to reinvent himself, he remained there until his death as a neglected and forgotten pauper. Like Charles Worth, for whom he briefly worked, Poiret was a turn-of-the-century archetype of the grand couturier as dictator, a job both men seemed to enjoy as much as, if not more, than dressing women. Together, they set the tone for the role of the great designer, still with us today. The tantrums, the refusal to accept legitimate criticism, the need for adulation, these and many other characteristics of the great designer sprang from the attitudes of these two extraordinary men, who could understand and interpret the moods and needs of the women of their time more fully than most present-day designers do, because they worked on a small scale, where every client was known, and so were her dress attitudes and lifestyle. Paul Poiret once described by Jean Cocteau as looking like a huge chestnut, had the figure and mental attitude of a worker, but his personality was more complex. He was heterosexual, and he moved in the social circles of the women he dressed, including his wife, whom he used as a model. She attended grand social occasions in Poiret's most striking creations with the intention of attracting the attention of fellow guests who would in considerable numbers, beat a path to her husband's Maison de Couture, determined to be a member of the coterie of smart women dressed by him, regardless of his very high prices. The fashionable world of Paris in the early years of the 20th century, when Poiret's powers reached their zenith, is not easy for modern minds to understand. Inside the closed, upper-class society of pre-World War I Paris, Breeding and class are what open the gilded doors of high society, along with a certain social notoriety. Actresses, dancers, and even music hall performers, if they were in a liaison with a man rich and powerful enough to silence all but whispered criticism, were admitted by many couturiers, albeit on sufferance. Paul Poiret, with his eye for publicity, welcomed them, even the courtesans. This world of display became Poiret's playground, although it was not one into which he was born. His father owned a small textile business, and the family was comfortably bourgeois. Born in 1879, a true Parisian, there was little in Poiret's early years that might suggest the glittering career to come, a career not without its problems, largely caused by the personality and ego of the man himself. But not entirely, Poiret was caught at one of the intersections of history, where the signposts are not very helpful. His was a time when European culture was dominated by three geniuses, Poiret himself, Sergei Diaghilev and Marcel Duchamp. Add the Wiener Werkstatt and that was the cultural mix of the day, which moved not only fine art, but also design and applied art to a point where they could make the European statements that created the culture of the 20s for the rest of the world. And Poiret was very much part of this, though briefly. He was barely a player in the post-war scene, a legend for all the wrong reasons, his extravagance, arrogance and irresponsibility, 
rather than for his contribution to fashion and style. So, Poiret's parents weren't a huge fan of his excessive confidence and sent him to be an apprentice to an umbrella maker in the city. He was giving many of the leftover tasks, like stopping up holes in umbrellas with black gum. Poiret didn't seem to overly enjoy this job, but he was able to take silk scraps from the workroom and create clothing for his sister's dolls. The turning point came in his teen years, when the designer Louise Chirut purchased a dozen of his sketches. Poiret's start in fashion. Designer Jacques Doucet hired Poiret in 1896. His designs for Doucet were quite popular. His first design, a red cape, was particularly so, with 400 sold. He enjoyed his time with Doucet, but was called to serve in the military in 1900, for nearly a year. As we have seen with so many other people, he did not have a particularly good time in the military. He was stubborn and questioned a lot, not desired qualities when you are in the army. Poiret eventually got himself moved to convalescent leave, but all in all, not a success on either side. In 1901 though, Poiret moved on to bigger and better, when he joined the House of Worth. Founded in 1858 by Charles Frederick Worth, the House of Worth was operated by Worth and his descendants until 1952. It closed in 1956, and was revived in 1999 but did not succeed. The house dressed the rich, royal, and powerful people across Western society. Women traveled from England, Europe, the US, and further to purchase Worth wardrobes. Luckily for Poiret, he joined Worth just before Edward VII's coronation in August of 1902. The house was commissioned to create the sumptuous robes of state, and everyone worked on them for months. Poiret wasn't a fan of them. He learned a lot while working for Worth, but his own designs weren't overly welcome at the house. Poiret and the Princess, one of the most well-known Poiret anecdotes, is the story of how he met the Princess Beriatinsky, and it is a good indication of how the house felt about his designs. The Princess came to Worth to see new designs, and Poiret showed her one of his Confucius coats, a kimono-style wrapped coat. She was instantly offended, as it reminded her of the clothing that slaves wore in Russia. He was ahead of his time, and perhaps not the best fit for the House of Worth. The House of Poiret Poiret founded his own fashion house in 1903, to create more of his loose-fitting designs. He aimed to free women from their corsets, a bold premise in the early 20th century. It seems that people either loved or hated his designs. Interestingly, Poiret could not sew. Although there are many designers now who cannot sew, it was not common in the period. His draped designs feature minimal stitching for that reason. He promoted his designs through loud and colorful window displays, and by hosting elaborate society parties throughout Paris. There were elaborate forests created, and hired actors and dancers to perform dramas and act as statues. He would also have his mannequins, aka models, walk throughout the party with his new designs. It was at these parties, that two of his legendary designs, the harem pants and the lampshade dress, debuted. It was an incredibly effective way to promote his work, though he wouldn't admit that until he published his autobiography. In 1910, Poiret expanded his business to include fragrances and even interior design. This isn't surprising given that his father worked in home textiles. Interestingly, when the house was revived in 1999, the fragrances were the most popular. Like many other artists in France and Europe as a whole, 
Poiret was enamored with Orientalism. The Ballet Russe performed Chez Herazod in 1910 in Paris, and his designs took on even more Eastern qualities. It was during this time that his harem pants and lampshade dress appeared, and customers adored these designs. During the First World War, Poiret returned to the military to serve as a tailor. The position was much better suited to his skills and personality than his previous assignment, but the house did suffer during this time. Not only had life in general changed, fashion had also changed. When he returned in 1919, the house of Poiret was near bankruptcy and his designs were no longer in style. Chanel and newer designers were creating sleek, androgynous pieces, while Poiret's larger coats and dresses felt oversized and sloppy. By 1929, the house of Poiret had closed, and he ended his life in poverty. He spent the last years of his life doing odd jobs, including selling sketches in cafes and bartending. Designer Elsa Schiaparelli was a friend of Poiret, and paid for his burial in 1944. And it was the end of such great story. Thanks for your watching and please, don't forget to subscribe. That's very important for me.